You're listening to a podcast from Blogging Heads TV. Hello, Bill. Good morning, Matt. Welcome to the DMZ, everybody. So you're tying it back now. <laughs> um, it feels a little, uh, it's a little more professional, I guess. I don't know. I've gotten so much uh, guff about my hair. It's it's so weird. I One thing I've learned, you know, um, years ago, uh, Tucker Carlson, when he quit wearing a bow tie, he said that he didn't realize it at the time, but wearing a bow tie is like having a middle finger around your around your neck. And I've discovered that having long hair really offends people. And uh, and I'm not sure why, but it really does. Uh, I two things I want to say about that. Uh, number one, I'm not convinced Tucker Carlson is really worried about having a middle finger dangling around his neck. That kind of <laughs> seems like who he wants to be in life. Um, let me let me tell you a long hair story. Um, so when I was a teenager, I had long hair, and it was the '80s, the Reagan era, and uh, at least where I went to school, n- nobody, no, no boy in my class had long hair. I was the only one, and it, it, it created this visceral reaction with people. Yeah, that how dare I flaunt societal norms by doing this, um, and people just would just badger me all the time. I, I did some plays and like the directors, I, I would, I was playing like the dad and bye bye birdie. And it was like, you can't have long hair and play the dad and bye bye birdie. I was like, well, I'll just, I'll just tie it back and pin it up. And they're like, you know, no, you, you gotta, you gotta sacrifice for the show and cut your hair for the show. I'm like, nope, not, not doing it. Um, and then, uh, when I was a senior, I was, uh, taunting the gym teacher uh, and I was, I was say, I said to him, if I can beat you in a game on one on one, then I should get out of gym for the rest of the year. And he said, "All right, but if I win, you have to cut your hair." <laughs> I thought about that. It was like this because you know, when you're, especially when you're a kid, your hair is really your identity. You know, <laughs> didn't Homer Simpson say that once? Yeah, yeah. When you're a, when you're a teenager or a cartoon character, it's both true. Um, <laughs> this was this philosophical uh, uh, dilemma. Like, okay, your hair is really important to you, but that's just symbolic. Like getting out of gym, like that's a tangible good. <laughs> Wouldn't you risk your hair to get out of gym for the rest of the year? That's that's a big deal. I said, okay, I'll do it. Um, and then this this got out. It's got on the whole school. Uh, and it snowballed into a Friday night event that was going to be the pregame for the varsity basketball game. And by we had a, we had a school that had terrible sports teams. Like no one would ever go to a sports to a sports ball thing on a Friday. That just never happened. But everyone was a buzz. <laughs> That there would be this game where Bill Sher might have to cut his hair. And so this got that's up great, to that's great press for you, man. So this got up to you know the principal's office where they were like, there is no way you get a gym class. <laughs> <laughs> like you're gonna have to change the terms of this deal. Um I feel like they try to make they try to make like a donation to charity or something or other. But the gym teacher's like, "Don't worry, Bill. If you win, I'll, 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 we'll do the deal. Don't worry about it." And so, literally, like the, the rafters were packed. Like this is, there's never been a sporting event at my school where like the it was like a sold out <laughs> event. It was like a sold out event. Um, and uh, I like was like really you know being a showboat i came with like pink spandex and no shirt and a green axel rose bandana <laughs> and I, I had i like warm-up music and i'm like this, wait is there a video does video exist of this this, this is before the smartphone era so there's no there's, there's no evidence I, I can't i can't prove the story is true um and i 
I was so worked up, I tired myself out on the war bump. <laughs> uh, but the very first play, I had a fadeaway baseline jumper, nothing but net. One nothing, Bill Share. Crowd goes wild. And then the Jim Dietrich got 11 straight points, and I lost 11 to 1. <laughs> um, and my now wife was assigned the job of cutting my hair on the spot. <laughs> Wait, and so this was like like uh, in the WWF, there used to be like Brutus the Barber Beefcake. <laughs> There were like wrestling matches, right? Where you would, if you lost, they would shave your head on, right. on, yeah. This ravenous school mob <laughs> piled into the center of the court. <laughs> and my now wife and I had to be like, like push through the sea of people to get to the center of the court. The principal got the first cut. <laughs> This is it's like a public hanging. The, the bloodthirsty mass is so much wanted my hair to be cut. That that's how the far mob. it went. So that should have told you everything you need to know about the dangers of the mob. Now, were you completely shaven? Like no, bald no, I, I end up with kind of like a kind of a skater cut. Okay. Okay, well, that's that's better than nothing. No, I've been I've been I've really been surprised, and I don't know if it's I think it's a combination of factors. Um, I, I think that I think some of it is um, that if people have a picture of you in their head, you can't deviate from that. I think some of it might also be a matter of age, you know, like maybe like long hair is a, a young man's a young Bill Shares move, like a high school Bill Shares move. <clears throat> like my kids have taken to saying I'm an old hippie. And I had to tell them, like, if you go back and listen to that Bellamy Brothers song. He turned 35, you know, like the song about the, you know, the song I'm talking about. I don't old, actually. He's an old hippie. The guy's 35 <laughs> in the song. So, I mean, you know, come on, what's, what's old these days? You know, it's, it's, this, you know, if we were back in the old days, you and I would probably be packing it up about now, but <laughs> Tom Brady could be out there, you know, winning Super Bowls if, if he wanted to. So come on. Um, but anyway, you look good. Uh, we should get down to business. We can talk about hair all day long, I know, but we should get down to business. Well, I think we should talk more about um, <clears throat> that great movie with Matt Damon and Barbara Streisand. <laughs> 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 Let me just say, uh, I watched um, uh, The Wolf of Wall Street the last couple days. Another great Matt Damon film. Yeah. <laughs> No, that one actually is Leonardo DiCaprio. Oh, is that right? <laughs> yeah, and you could tell because he looks really different. <laughs> Speaking of people whose whose looks have changed, <laughs> uh, was I? You know, I haven't seen his. Is that good? Um, yeah, I would. Uh, I would say it's. I would definitely say it's worth seeing. You know, the first half of it um, is is you know it's it's sort of hard to watch because this guy on his way up is engaging in all sorts of like really debaucherous behavior. And he's kind of just getting rewarded for being a, just a bad, bad person. But of course he gets taken, you know, he ends up getting taken down and getting his comeuppance overall. Uh, I think it's a pretty good film. All right. You know, my big, my big social media, my big um, uh, media accomplishment. Um, what's the word? word? Content accomplishment was I finished uh, season two, Ted Lasso. Oh yeah, yeah. So the uh, what did you think of the episode where um, the assistant coach goes out on the town? Was that not bizarre? Yeah, that wasn't my favorite. Um, uh, I mean, I'm happy to see Beard get you know his day in the sun. Yeah. So what I read was uh, they were normally they were planning for ten episode seasons, mm -hmm. and Apple was like, "No, we want twelve this time." They were like, "Oh great, we have a storyboard out for ten. What are we going to do for these extra two? And so that's why they did that one to sort of meet, yeah. the, meet, meet the But the Christmas order. one, which was one of the two, I thought the Christmas episode was really good. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously that one was sort of just stuck in there. And then they did this one with Beard going out on the town, which I just think was super bizarre. Some people actually love it. 
But overall, um, I thought it was a bad episode. Overall, I, I really, um, I really like Ted Lasso. Yeah, I've I've two, I've two principles that are increasingly in tension. One is that I don't like it, and this is very common now. I don't like it when uh, TV writers get um, antsy and throw away what worked in season one, to, like yeah. mix it up in season two. Yeah. Uh, I feel like, you know, you, you did something good in season one. Like, uh, so again, it's, 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 these, these are 80s rules. Like, you got a formula. Stick with your formula. Dude, I'm here yeah. for reliable comfort. Please give me my reliable Well, comfort. look, I think they could have milked it. Uh, you know, you don't have to stick with it forever, but you can milk it a few years. And I think I know where you're going with this. Um, you know, Ted Lasso was so refreshing mm-hmm. because he was such a nice – Guy, which I think is really out of keeping for any football coach. I mean, you know, there are football coaches who are nicer than others, but I don't really think he went to some championship in college as a American football mm-hmm. team. I, I don't really think you that's plausible that you could be that nice, but whatever. <laughs> um, and and then now they're building up the possibility that 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 his demeanor is just the product of of suppressing trauma, mm-hmm. which I think. You know, the danger there is that it undermines the fact that he's actually a nice guy, which I think is why everyone kind of loved him and loved the show. Um, it's only, it it makes it more makes a more complicated character and it's more challenging yeah. for the audience. Uh, and too many people would argue, and I don't I'm not disagreeing with them, that that makes it for a more rich and complex and satisfying show. Uh, and this goes to my other principle that is in comic with the first principle, which is I hate overanalyzing shows. I hate people who nitpick every episode and like, and, and dissect every, everything to the, to, to the, uh, to, to an inch of death. And it's like, look, if you buy into a show, buy into the show, enjoy yeah. the show. If you stop, if you don't like the show anymore, then stop watching, go watch something else. Um, so I, I've committed, yeah. I'm into, I, I'm, I'm in for the long haul. If there's, if there's some episode I don't like the beard episode, you know, season of the great, um, to Hulu show about, Loosely based on Catherine the Great. I recommend it. Um, before we move on, Bill, you and I, we, we really have to talk about Howard Hesman, I think. Dr. Johnny Fever. Yes. Uh, we lost. I, I, I don't know if I just had lunch with mom yesterday. Mom and two of my aunts. Um, uh, uh, Bob Evans. Uh, Bob Evans. <laughs> nice. Stay, stay connected. Um, and, and I had this conversation with them. And I the question is, like. Have there been more celebrities die in the last two months than in history? Or have I just reached an age where it's hitting home to me? It's, because it's, it's the latter. The people who are dying are people. It's not like, um, I don't know, like Bing Crosby died like in, in 1992. But I was like, well, the guy's a million years old. Like I have no connection to Bing Crosby. But now with Dr. Johnny Fever... It's really hitting yeah, home. The, the, like, the childhood heroes are go, are going down, which is always more unsettling. Um, yeah. I mean, celebrities, We've have, celebrities have always die. That's not a new phenomenon. <laughs> celebrities die. <laughs> it seems like a lot of them. But Howard Hessman, and, and particularly you and I have, have talked a lot over the years about uh, WKRP in Cincinnati. Um, I don't know, Bill, thoughts? Well, if you go back to, you know, you, we talked about my turkeys away um, innovation because what you can get on Amazon Prime and other streaming services is not the pristine episode because they had copyright issues with some of the songs. Uh, but you can find, and, and there's a key scene that's either, you know, butchered completely or, or modified, uh, which involves the song Dogs by Pink Floyd. And it's really integral to, the, it's only integral to the scene. The scene is integral to the show. Uh, because you take that scene out or you dilute it, the setup is really hampered. Yeah. Uh, it's really in the first half of the episode, it's the it's really the pinnacle of how out of touch and out of sorts the big guy has become. Yeah. That he walks and, and then the whole show before I'll get just to put a pin in that for one second. Correct me if I'm wrong, Bill. The whole premise, the initial premise of WKRP in Cincinnati is it had been a classical radio station. Yeah. They decide to go to a rock and roll format. 
they they have um they bring in Dr. Johnny Fever. He was he, he was this, he was already there. Okay. He he he, but, he, but he, was, he was miserable playing, playing classical Travis. music, but he was already there. That's interesting that he was there. They bring in Andy Travis, yeah. who's the 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 program manager, and he wants them to play top forty hits that are actually you know what everyone's well, playing. Well, rock. He's gonna be. It's not disco, you know. It's a rock and roll station. Yeah, but Johnny Fever says that no, a disc jockey should get to play what he wants to play, basically. Well, in the the, the in the pilot, we learned that he was fired from a rock station because he said booger on the air. This is fever. Fever. Uh, yeah. Now he's uh, now he's stuck with jobs he doesn't want uh, because he got because he got kind of quasi blacklisted. And then once Andy Travis comes in as the new station manager, saying you can play rock and roll again, he, yeah. he scratches the classical music and, and now and you know changes his whole persona and 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 screams booger into the microphone. <laughs> One uh, more thing, should, fellow babies. Right. Right. Um, um, Speaking of, uh, I won't comment on, on the Bailey Jennifer thing because because you never take the bait. <laughs> but let me just say this: Andy Travis, good looking guy, yeah. and 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 hair, a, a nice head of hair. Uh, Back to hair. It's always you in the hair, Matt. And I feel like Andy Travis un- probably underrated as as, as we'll, we'll say it as a sex symbol. Well, he was a great great straight man. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, the best shows, the best shows are always it's like Newhart. You know. Straight man in the middle, crazy people all around him or her. Uh, you know that's that that that's your perfect formula. And KRP was a classic example of that. Um, and so to get back to what I say about the Turkey yeah, Turkey's yeah. Way episode, w- the, when you see the scene, the full scene of the big guy walking in the studio while Johnny Fever is playing dogs, it's it's great acting on Johnny Fever's parts. It's, it's great restrained acting. I mean, there's you know there's Howard has been, you know, going over the top and saying booger, which is a great scene too. But this is more, you know, sort of, you know, stone Johnny fever, you know, behind, hiding behind sunglasses, raising an eyebrow, <laughs> uh, not giving the big guy what he wants. Uh, he's, he's looking for some connection and Johnny fever not giving it to him. Uh, it's just a fantastic scene. And so it, yeah. it really mars the episode where you don't see that scene. I mean, and you, 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 you see have... it in honor of him today. And and how do people do that, Bill? Well, it's on YouTube. You can find that scene okay. on YouTube. And so, if you find my Twitter thread, you search me on Twitter with my name and KRP. You'll find that thread. And I have a link to the God. YouTube there. He was also on a show called Head of the Class. Great show, really good show. Um, and I remember an episode. I mean, I haven't seen. I don't know if they ever. I don't think they show reruns of it anywhere. But I mean, but but I watched it in real time yeah. in like the the nineteen eighties. Um. Late late eighties, and I remember there was an episode I think where they went to Russia, right after the fall, maybe before the fall of the Soviet Union, and I remember they were, it was like a class trip, and I think they were trying to sell blue jeans, or so, some of the some of the, the the students had like snuck blue jeans into the maybe former Soviet Union at that point. I, I don't remember, um, but. Uh, Anyway, yeah, my, he was, my head of the class he recall is poor because I haven't had the opportunity to rewatch those episodes. But I do remember watching the show regularly at the time. Yeah, it was good, as I recall. Anyway, um, uh, I'd like to just do pop culture, but I, I guess we should move on. Why don't you want to talk Whoopi? Do you want? Well, to, okay, you, we could do that. Do you want to do a, a slight transition. segue into the to yeah our politics. So okay, so Whoopi Goldberg, um, basically. As far as I can tell, she believes that um, the Holocaust wasn't racism because Jewish people, according to Whoopi, Jewish people are white. You can't tell them apart from ger- you know regular Germans from Jewish Germans, um, and therefore she believes that the Holocaust was not about race, um, but it was just about man's human inhumanity to man. Now, of course, she misses the fact that the Nazis thought that they were a master race and they were specifically targeting Jewish people, not based on religion, as far as I know, but based on race. And um, but she has been, uh, I guess, suspended. It it seems like it's not a serious thing. Um, But but, uh, you know, I do have to change this morning. I mean, I've, I've been offline this morning. Um, as far as you know, she is still suspended. They haven't walked yes. back. 
That's true. Um, but I don't think it's I don't think she's in any jeopardy of 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 being terminated or, or anything like that. Um, but it, it I have I have actually seen several conservatives on Twitter defending her, saying that she's ignorant, she's wrong, but that she's she's not she's not being anti-Semitic by what she's saying. She just happens to be wrong about it. But Bill, what do you think? Well, yeah, I mean, number one, there's a really just, uh, you know, at score, you know, a, a, a semantic argument with obviously highly charged, you know, undercurrents. Um, but she wasn't trying to suggest that the Holocaust didn't happen, that it was it didn't that it didn't involve Jews, uh, that's been overhyped. You know, she wasn't doing any of that kind of Holocaust denial or Holocaust minimizing kind of stuff. She just thought that since Jews are white and Aryans are white, that's not a race thing. It's a, it's a different kind of evil. She called it evil. Yes. You know? So there was no minimization on her part, uh, but it just it just obscured the fact that I think a lot of Jews do consider themselves a race. I'm sorry that the, the Nazis consider them a race and a lesser yeah. race that need to be extinguished. Um, she apologized. She went on Colbert and tried to explain herself better and understood and acknowledged that she was causing hurt and that she wasn't trying to cause hurt, all that kind of stuff. You know, was it like the greatest apology of all time? I mean, maybe fall a little short of the greatest apology of all time, but I think it was a sincere, accepted apology. Um, uh, she was willing to reflect and be introspective and, you know, have more conversations. And she still did. doesn't, she still doesn't get it. That's clear. But that's, look, that's not a capital offense she doesn't she just doesn't well, get i it. think i think she was still a little hung up on making that point but she was also acknowledging hey i get it that that's not the way other people see it yes um uh and she wasn't trying to like be all like i'm right you're wrong you know uh so now, I, I guess one of the problems is okay number one Whoopi goldberg's got to be like 70 years old you know, well, when did Jumpin' Jack Flash or DC Cab come out or whatever? Well, you know, the thing that just, is, always sister all, act. all these heroes of ours in the 80s weren't all that much older than us when they became successful. So, um. <laughs> I mean, Whoopi's got to be, I don't know, we could Google it, but but she she's no spring chicken. How did, and, 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 and she's on a show, she's on a show every day where she opines about politics, which I think highlights the fact that, that, that these people, that this whole show, The View, is a whole bunch of people who don't always know what they're talking about, opining about things. I mean, look, we people have gaps in their knowledge. I know I do, but that's a pretty big like worldview <laughs> blind spot for her to have. And she's on TV every day lecturing people about what they should believe and what they shouldn't. I mean, you you, you talk on, the, on TV radio that long, you're going to say something that's you know a misfire. <laughs> Uh, and not a misfire though. I mean, it, this wasn't misspeaking. She, no. she revealed a, um, a gap, I would say in her knowledge. Yeah. But I agree. But like how serious a transgression is that, especially when she's willing to, you know, ad admit error and have further conversation about it, you know? So, uh, I don't think it warrants suspension. And in fact, I've seen all sorts of folks on Twitter, um, uh, Jewish figures saying, I don't know any Jews that were suspended. <laughs> this is really, over, this is really excessive. Yeah. Um, that's why I wonder maybe that it might get walked back today or, or soon. But it, it definitely seems like an example of TV executives being overly cautious and not wanting to be behind the curve on something yeah. uh, and, and, and overshooting the mark on their part. Um, well, and Dave, David Frum has suggested a trade because someone who did misspeak is Ilya Shapiro. Did you see this, Bill? Well, not, you know about not only did I see it, Matt. Okay. Um, and just so, you know, so here's a uh, conservative figure. He was at Cato. He got hired by Georgetown Law to be with the dean of one of their programs or something. Uh, he ju just got hired or he just got or he just just started the job. And he, he made a crack about Biden picking a black woman for SCOTA saying the obvious um, pick is, I, I forget the person's name, um, but he's, um, Indian American, if I believe, uh, on the DC circuit. And he was like, this is, this is obviously the most qualified person. And now Biden's going to pick a lesser black woman. Uh, mm -hmm. and so we got, he, he got, 
cable. It's jiggling. Um, and, but once he, again, he apologized once again, for I mean, it, but then George Jetson... This Jetson reminds used, me... Well, uh, just to, just, just to, oh, just sure, to do sure. the background here. He did an apology. He took down the post. Um, Georgetown Law said, we're going to put you... We're going to suspend you, paid, while we investigate this incident. You know, so... You know, he has said he thinks he's going to be fine because he didn't violate any of Georgetown's policies. Uh, so I I had a piece about Bill, Bill Maher a couple months ago that you and I talked about. Um, it went online the Washington Month. They got put into the print magazine earlier last month. And Bill Maher keeps saying controversial, obnoxious things. So I keep <laughs> pushing it on Twitter. And so this one conservative guy goes by Red Steez. You know what I'm talking yeah. about? Yeah, I think I've muted or blocked that yeah, person. Yeah, yeah. Stephen yeah. somebody. Yeah. Um, he he quote tweeted my tweet with some reference to Georgetown law, which of course is not what Bill Bill Martin told him about Democrats sucking in regards to the infrastructure bill and crime in San Francisco and the pandemic. This is before this whole Ilya Shapiro thing even happened, and so he did the thing about saying, you know. Um, that sort of Georgetown law, you know, disproves me. And now I got this like 24 hours of conservatives in my feed talking about Georgetown law. Here's your period. I'm like, what does it do to anything? <laughs> I mean, and I even had a response to this Red Steeds guy saying, since when did the DNC take over Georgetown law? Because <laughs> Bill Maher's talking about Democrats, not just like rando progressives. And like this isn't even a point that's like that all his followers accept because he was like, who are the people at Georgetown Law? I'm like, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going back and forth because I don't care enough. But just for our purposes, I don't care if every single person at Georgetown Law is a Democrat. They don't speak for Democrats. <laughs> just like if there are 10 conservatives that do something, they don't speak for all conservatives. Um, so I clearly I, I this is something that's, that's really gone like the right, like completely, you know, out of their mind outrage. They think it's like indicative of everything they believe about the left. Well, look, I, don't, I, I think that person that you're referring to on Twitter is not a honest broker. Um, but I, I, you know, I do think we have uh, there's questions out about cancel culture and, and free speech. And I think that like, just, just like Whoopi, um, you know, said something that was wrong. Um, but there really wasn't any malice involved. I, I think the same thing's true of, of, of Ilya Shapiro, who, um, was making, I think a valid at least a legitimate point. You may disagree with it, but like the point he was making is that you know Joe Biden um, really is 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 pushing the identity politics thing by by pledging that he would pick a certain type of nominee based on race and gender. Um, and Ilya is arguing, well, actually, there's a Indian American progressive who would, is actually more qualified. So so by um, why not pick the most qualified progressive? Now, look, I don't know anything about whether this other guy that Ilya, Ilya knows a lot more about the law and, and, and uh, jurisprudence than I do. So I'll have to defer to his judgment. Um, but it's not a racist thing, he said. Well, I mean, where it gets murky is the phrase lesser black woman. Yeah. Um, I mean, not not a good not a good phrase. And but he he I might try to defend means. himself and say, I'm not, "I'm not trying to say that all blacks are lesser than the Americans. Uh, I'm just saying that this other guy is so unquestionably the most qualified that anybody black, white, Latino, whatever, yeah. would be lesser." But I understand why I would, the, the words were misinterpreted, and I apologize. I took it down. Da, da, da. Um, you know, I'm not saying I think it's a very good argument on the merits. I mean, the, the, the thing where I feel he proves the point of people who want to see a black woman on the court is this whole notion of, like, who is the most qualified is not a quantitative objective measurement. Um, and so often African-Americans, African-American women get on the short end of these so-called objective metrics because they haven't had the same opportunities for so long. Uh, so someone, I mean, there's someone else on the D.C. circuit now. He, she just got there because Biden appointed her. She's been there very long. Um, uh, and the guy's an Obama appointee, so he's been there for more years. So you can say, well, mm -hmm. he is therefore more qualified. But, of course, 
there were people who were on the court for a long period of time. Amy Cody Barrett, she was on the court for very long. Was Leah Shapiro, Shapiro complaining that, oh, why, why didn't Trump pick X, Y, or Z? Why didn't he pick this white man or this Indian man or whatever who had more years in the court? He didn't do that. So why is he doing it in this case? Um, you know, I, who, who's, who's scolding Ronald Reagan for pledging to pick a woman during the 1980 campaign? Um, Susan Collins pretending that didn't even happen. That didn't happen in the campaign, which it clearly did. Well, no, I, I think Susan Collins, I think, said Reagan didn't say this pick, my first pick, will be a woman. He said that, like, I, my my hope is that I'm going to name her. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, he, but he made a in my presidency. He made a play in the campaign, yeah. in October, October 1980. He didn't say it would be my first pick. Okay, well, that's, that's the that, that, That's a slight difference. That, no, I think that's a big difference. I don't think it's a big difference at all. Look, it was a campaign pledge to make sure a woman got on the court. It's first, okay. second, or third, who cares? He's, he's, he's making an identity politics decision. To make it a pledge, not like not a maybe, not a hope, a pledge. Um, by the only difference is that it was a, more of a guarantee that I'm not gonna I'm not gonna jerk you around with it. I'm gonna do it the first thing. That's the only difference. I mean, Collins on Stephanopoulos um, this week, ABC suggested that Reagan. That the difference was that Biden said it in the campaign and Reagan didn't, and that's just wrong. Reagan did say mm, it. In the campaign. Okay. I do think, though, it's a I mean, you may not agree. I think it's a big distinction between saying like this pick, I am going to pick a black woman versus saying I pledge if I'm elected that I will nominate a woman to the Supreme Court. You know what I'm saying? Like like that could be your second pick. You know, how many did Reagan get in two terms? He he got several. Uh let me, let me make a sub point here. You know, San Diego. Well, look, and, and I think, and I think, and you know, I've heard others, uh, uh, Charlie Sykes, and Jonah Goldberg, other other people have made sort of this point. But I think there's just a consensus among center right folks that Biden should have probably picked an African African American woman, um, but he should have gone through this performative. <laughs> This is sort of like the argument when Mitch McConnell said, look, we could have hearings with Merrick Garland and then vote him down. It's just better to not go through that that charade. But I think that that there is a sense that it would have been better to say, look, I'm going to pick the most qualified person. And then you pick an African-American woman who's going to be highly qualified. I think all you know, every every person I've seen on that list is highly qualified. But to come out initially and say, I'm going to pick an African-American woman, this pick risks, um, you know, first of all, it's sort of like nakedly uh, political because you're fulfilling a pledge you made in order to get the nomination. That did, you know, like Jim Clyburn delivered the nomination for Joe Biden in exchange for this political, for this pledge um, and I think it also potentially denigrates the person who ends up on the court. You know, it makes it look like they weren't necessarily uh, the most qualified when, in fact, again, they will be highly qualified. Let me, let me, let me say a few things. Um, one, mm -hmm. like the notion that, well, if you don't make it plain, and you do it kind of subtly, that, that, that makes everyone better off. I mean, I don't think that is necessarily a saving grace. Uh and it's certainly not the case that um, the way Republican presidents have gone about it have been to ensure that you're getting the most qualified person. There is no argument that Sanjay O'Connor had the longest resume of any option. Well, look, going I in. wish Reagan. I wish Reagan had not picked Sandra Day O'Connor <laughs> too. Well, and that, also but, Clarence Thomas. And I'm wearing there, there's no I'm argument. Wearing an Arizona shirt as, as we speak. There is no argument that Clarence Thomas was the most qualified person for the job. Based on resume alone, when he was picked, I mean, he was barely on the court. He was like an Amy Cody Barron. He was young, been on the court for like a year and a half. There are plenty of judges have been around for longer, uh, but clearly want to have a conservative African American to replace Thurgood Marshall. They just did say it openly in advance. So I don't know if that means that like you were you you were not playing the affirmative action identity politics game. You most obviously are. Um, now, in this particular case, I think. Uh, so, like, number one, there's always been identity politics on the court. Uh, you can say it's identity politics to have white white men for 100-plus years solely. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that for a long time, there was a 
wink wink Catholic seat and a wink wink Jewish seat. Uh, and then LBJ picked Thurgood Marshall, and Bush picked Scott Thomas. Um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was replaced by Eddie Cody Barrett. Cindy O'Connor. I mean, this has always been a thing. There's, there's, always, there's always been identity politics. Period in all of politics. You are trying to appeal to constituencies, and some people have, have identified with with identities, uh, and you appeal you appeal to Italians or the Irish or what have you. It, it is nothing new. Uh, now, the interesting thing. It, now, is, but is it? But I, mean, I would say. There is an argument. Is it better to be honest about the transactional nature of politics? And just be honest about it. Or is it better for it to be a wink wink, to have a pretense that we're not operating that way? And in fact, oftentimes we do. Is there something to be gained from well, that? I think it? I think it depends on circumstance. I mean, I think there's certainly times when someone getting a stigma of being an affirmative action hire undercuts them on day one, and they have to overcome that, and that's unfair to them. Um, in this case, um, well, I just want to do a little backstory, because I think, I think it's an interesting backstory, because not only did Clyburn tell Biden, this is in the run-up to the South Carolina primary, Biden hadn't won a primary yet, Clyburn's saying, hey, I want to endorse you and get you over the finish line here, but you got to get a black woman on the court, you got to say that, and Biden, was, and Biden said, sure. And then in the South Carolina debate, they're like three-quarters of the way through, and they've talked about the court, and he didn't say it. And they're in a break, and Clyburn goes to Biden and say, hey, guy, what are you doing? You're blowing this. you got to say this now. And it's literally like, like it's like one of the last questions, or like the last question, and it's nothing to do with the court at all. Yeah. The, well, question, the, good, the good news, the question the good news was, for Biden. What's that? The good news for Biden is most of his answers are discordant. Well, yeah, and, yeah. And apropos of nothing. And so it. It didn't seem weird to me at the time. <laughs> but the question was, you know, what's what's people's biggest misconception about you? And he is like, b- throws in there, we're going to have a black woman <laughs> on the court, and the crowd goes wild. <laughs> and that, and and, and Cl- Clarence said, you know, thumbs up. Uh, so so he made the, when he made the pledge, he made it bluntly. He repeated it over the course of the campaign. Nobody really complained about it in the campaign. I didn't see Republicans, you know, crying their eyes out, how dare he do this? What was interesting to me in the campaign was that he did such a brazen identity politics maneuver without upsetting white people, without generating that kind of backlash. Because Biden didn't have other things. Yeah. To just, hey, but I'm I think he do boxed this. himself in. I, I, I think Kamala Harris has been a disaster. I think he boxed himself in. Um, I think... I admire Biden for honoring his pledges and his commitments. I do. I think it was an indecent proposal. I think that Biden should have promised Clyburn that he would do his best and that he would always have his ear and that this would be a goal. But but to make the explicit promise that that will be your first nominee will be that you are basing your selection on race and gender to me feels unethical and inappropriate. And it was a deal. This isn't, you know, in the case of Reagan, I mean, I guess it was a deal he made with the American public, but he basically, Clyburn is like conditioning his support based on uh, negotiating this this deal. I'm not saying, I mean, it's hardball, no question. Uh, but but I mean, Re- Reagan said it because he was getting hammered by Jimmy Carter as on the far right. It's like Carter basically, you may be made through with me, but this guy's Looney Tunes. You don't want you don't want to go in with all the bigots and the sexists and the racists here. Uh, and this was Reagan's way of saying, hey, I'm not that guy. You know, I'm going to put a woman on the court. It's all good, which worked. Um, yeah. In the in this case, um, I think one of the reasons why I don't think it's going to be a net negative for Biden. Let me ask you two things here. One here, I think it is relatively more controversial now than in the campaign. One, because conservatives are making it controversial. They're 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 introducing the element of controversy to it. If they didn't talk about it, it would it, it wouldn't even be a poll question that would be asked. But now we had the poll question. Now we're seeing sort of five percent. You know, don't want them to do it this way. Um, Second thing is that people are unhappy with all these other elements of the Biden administration. So mm-hmm. it's not controversial initially because people are like, oh, he's going to do this, but he's not going to hurt me. It's not a zero-sum game. Yeah. Biden understands that we're the middle Wait class. Wait a second. 
that makes it less likely I'm going to be nominated for the court bill. Come on, <laughs> I mean, come on. Um, <laughs> uh, so I think there's. So I think he, Biden doesn't have the advantage of people feeling good about their lot in life now. So now this feels a bit more like an irritant to to certain types of white voters. Um, but having said that, because there are a good number of manifestly well qualified black women options here. The person who is paid, like, no one's going to argue this person doesn't deserve the job. This person's going to be fitted with an inch of her life. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, look, if you pick somebody who's got a big controversy that was, get that gets dug up, that's another story. Yeah. And it, and it also doesn't change the structure of the court, the, the left, right. We don't, mean that, we don't even, that's not even an issue here. So yeah. Biden's be able to say, not only did I make this pledge, but I did it in a way that ensured a qualified person got on the court. I'm not demeaning the quality of the court by any way. I am proving that qualified people were getting shut out of the process before unfairly, mm-hmm. and I'm fixing that problem. Now, there is an interesting thing, though, that has to do with the quali- who's qualified. And what, and what does qualified mean? Because there's this interesting judge, 